This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Richards from FutilityRadio.com. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 18. Dr. Seward's Diary. 30th September. I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived, but had already studied the transcript of the various diaries and letters which Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men, of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea, and I can honestly say that, for the first time since I've lived in it, this old house seemed like home. When we had finished tea, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favour? I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty that I could not refuse her, and there was no possible reason why I should, so I took her with me. When I went into the room I told the man that a lady would like to see him, to which he simply answered, Why? She is going through the house and wants to see everyone in it, I said. Oh, very well, he said. Let her come in by all means, but just wait a minute till I tidy up the place. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all of the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared, or was jealous of, some interference. When he'd got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, Let the lady come in, and sat down on the edge of his bed with his head down, but with his eyelids raised so that he could see her as she entered. For a moment I thought he might have some homicidal intent. I remembered how quiet he had been just before he attacked me in my own study and I took care to stand where I could seize him at once if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness, which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is one of the qualities mad people most respect. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. "'Good evening, Mr. Renfield,' said she. "'You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you.' He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave away to one of wonder, which merged in doubt. Then, to my intense astonishment, he said, "'You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be, you know, for she's dead.' Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, "'Oh, no, I have a husband of my own, to whom I was married before I ever saw Dr. Seward, or he me. I am Mrs. Harker.' "'Then what are you doing here?' "'My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward.' "'Then don't stay.' "'But why not?' I thought that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker any more than it was to me, so I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? His reply was simply contemptuous, given in a pause in which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question! I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield, said Mrs. Harker, at once championing me. He replied to her with as much courtesy and respect as he had shown contempt to me. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is so loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of his inmates lean towards the errors of non causa and ignoratio illench. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I had ever met with, talking elemental philosophy, and with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wonder if it was Mrs. Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory. If this new phase was spontaneous, or in any way due to her unconscious influence, she must have some rare gift or power. We continued to talk for some time, and seeing that he was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly as she began to lead him to his favourite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why, I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that by consuming a multitude of living things, no matter how low in the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times I held the belief so strongly that I had actually tried to take a human life. 
The doctor here will bear me out that on one occasion I tried to kill him for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life. Though indeed the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarised the truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, doctor? I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew what to either think or say. It was hard to imagine that I had seen him eat up his spiders and flies not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, and I told Mrs. Harker that it was time to leave. She came at once, after saying pleasantly to Mr. Renfield, Goodbye, and I hope that I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself. To which, to my astonishment, he replied, Goodbye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Art seemed more cheerful than he has been since Lucy first took ill, and Quincy is more like his own bright self than he has been for many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with the eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once and rushed up to me, saying, Ah, friends, John, how goes all? Well, so, I have been busy, for I come here to stay if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell. Madam Mina is with you? Yes. And her so fine husband? And Arthur and my friend Quincy? They are with you too? Good. As I drove to the house, I told him of what had passed, and of how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Harker's suggestion, at which the professor interrupted me. Ah, that wonderful Madam Mina! She has a man's brain, a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, and a woman's heart. The good God fashioned her for a purpose, believe me, when he made that so good combination. Friend John, up to now fortune has made that woman of help to us. After tonight she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. It is not good that she run a risk so great. We men are determined, nay, are we not pledged to destroy this monster? But it is no part for a woman. Even if she be not harmed, her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer both in walking from her nerves, and in sleep from her dreams. And besides, she is young woman, and not so long married. There may be other things to think of some time, if not now. You tell me she has wrote all, then she must consult with us, but to-morrow we say good-bye to this work, and we go alone. I agreed heartily with him, and then I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed, and a great concern seemed to come on him. Oh, that we had known it before, he said, for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. However, the milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that, but go on our way to the end. Then he fell into silence that lasted till we entered my own gateway. Before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs. Harker, I am told, Madam Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all things that have been up to this moment. Not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, but up to this morning. But why not up till now? We have seen hitherto how good light all of the little things have made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told is the worst for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking a paper from a pocket, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this, and tell me if it must go in? It is my record of today. I too have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial, but there is little in this, except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely, and handed it back, saying, It need not go in if you do not wish it, but I pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you the more, and all us, your friends, more honour you, as well as more esteem and love. She took it back, with another blush, and a bright smile. And so now, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete, and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner and before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. The rest of us have already read everything, so when we meet in the study we shall all be informed as to facts, and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Mina Harker's Journal, 30th September When we met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of board or committee. Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right, and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next to the professor, and Dr. Seward in the centre. 
The professor said, I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers. We all expressed assent, and he went on. Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertained for me, so we can then discuss how we shall act, and can take our measure according. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. I admit that at the first I was sceptic. Were it not that through long years I have trained myself to keep an open mind, I could not have believed until such time as that fact thunder on my ear. See, see, I prove, I prove. Alas, had I known at first what now I know, nay, had I even guessed at him, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who did love her. But that is gone, and we must so work that other poor souls perish not, whilst we can save. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting once. He is only stronger, and being stronger have yet more power to work evil. This vampire which is amongst us of himself is so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal, for his cunning be the growth of ages, and have still the aids of necromancy, which is, as his etymology imply, the divination of the dead, and all the dead that he can come nigh to are for him at command. He is brute, and more than brute. He is devil in callous, and the heart of him is not. He can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the rat and the owl, and the bat, the moth, and the fox, and the wolf. And he can grow and become small, and he can at times vanish and come unknown. How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his where, and having found it, how can we destroy? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake, and there may be consequence to make the brave shudder. For if we fail in this, our fight, he must surely win, and then where end we? Life is nothings, I heed him not. But to fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him, that we henceforward become foul things of the night like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and the souls of those we love best. To us forever are the gates of heaven shut, for who shall open them to us again? We go on for all time abhorred by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the side of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case we must shrink. For me, I say no, but then I am old, and life, with his sunshine, his fair places, his songs of birds, his music and his love, lie far behind. You others are young, some have seen sorrow, but there are fair days yet in store. What say you? Whilst he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared, oh so much, that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him when I saw his hand stretch out. But it was life to me to feel its touch, so strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. It does not even need a woman's love to hear its music. When the professor had done speaking, my husband looked into my eyes and I in his. There was no need for speaking between us. I answer for Mina and myself, he said. Count me in, Professor, said Mr. Quincy Morris, laconically as usual. I am with you, said Lord Godalming, for Lucy's sake, if for no other reason. Dr. Seawood simply nodded. The Professor stood up, and, after laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand on either side. I took his right hand, and Lord Godalming his left. Jonathan held my right with his left, and stretched across to Mr. Morris. So as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. I felt my heart icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We resumed our places, and Dr. Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely, and in as business-like a way, as any other transaction of life. Well, you know what we have to contend against but we too are not without strength. We have on our side power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have sources of science, we are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered, and we are free to use them. 
we have self-devotion in a cause and an end to achieve, which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now, let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict, and how the individual cannot. In fine, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and this one in particular. All we have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much when the matter is one of life and death, nay of more than life and death. Yet must we be satisfied, in the first place because we have to be, no other means is at our control. And secondly, because, after all these things, tradition and superstition are everything. Does not the belief in vampires rest for others, though not, alas, for us on them? A year ago, which of us would have received such a possibility in the midst of our scientific, sceptical, matter-of-fact 19th century? We even scouted a belief that we saw justified under our very eyes. Take it, then, that the vampire, and the belief in his limitations and his cure, rest for the moment on some base. For, let me tell you, he is known everywhere that men have been. In old Greece, in old Rome, he flourished in Germany all over, in France, in India, even in the Germanese and in China, so far from us in all ways. There even is he, and the peoples for him at this day. He have followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, the devil-begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, the Magyar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon, and let me tell you that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen in our own so unhappy experience. The vampire live on, and cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Even more, we have seen amongst us that he can grow younger, that his vital faculties grow strenuous, and seem as though they refresh themselves when his special pabulum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did never see him eat. Never. He throws no shadow. He make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observe. He has the strength of many of his hand. Witness again Jonathan when he shut the door against the wolves, and when he help him from the diligence too. He can transform himself to wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby, when he tear open the dog, he can be as a bat, as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby, and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house, and as my friend Quincy saw him in the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create, that noble ship's captain proved him of this, but, from what we know, the distance he can make this mist is limited, and it can only be round himself. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle of Dracula. He becomes so small, we ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hairbreadth space at the tomb door. He can, when once he find his way, come out from anything or into anything, no matter how close it be bound, or even fused up with fire, solder you call it. He can see in the dark, no small power this, in a world which is one half shut from the light. Ah, but hear me through. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. Nay, he is even more prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some nature's laws. Why? We know not. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be some one of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, as does that of all evil things, at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom. If he be not at the place whither he is bound, he can only change himself at noon, or exact sunrise, or sunset. These things we are told, and in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as he will within his limit, when he have his earth home, his coffin home, his hell home, the place unhallowed, as we saw when he went to the grave of the suicide at Whitby, still, at other time, he can only change when the time come. It is said, too, that he can only pass running water at the slack or the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of, and as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now when we resolve. To them he is nothing, but in their presence he take his place far off and silent with respect. There are others, too, which I shall tell you of, 
lest in our seeking we may need them. The branch of wild rose on his coffin keep him that he may not move from it, a sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him so that he be true dead. And as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen it with our own eyes. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him, if we obey what we know. But he is clever. I have asked my friend Arminius, of Budapest University, to make his record, and from all the means that are, he tell me of what he has been. He must indeed have been that Virvode Dracula, who won his name against the Turk over the great river on the very frontier of Turkey land. If it be so, then was he no common man, for in that time and for centuries after he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain and that iron resolution went with him to his grave, and are even now arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race, though now and again were scions who were held by their covals to have had dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Scholomans, amongst the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar as his due. In the records are such words as Strogokica, Witch, Ordog, and Pokol, Satan and Hell, and in one manuscript this very Dracula is spoken of as Vampire, which we all understand too well. There have been from the loins of this very one great man and good women, and their graves make sacred the earth, where alone this foulness can dwell. For it is not the least of its terrors that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good. In soil barren of holy memories it cannot rest. Whilst they were talking, Mr. Morris was looking steadily at the window, and he now got up quietly and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and then the professor went on. And now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. It seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain in the house beyond that wall where we look today, or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must trace... Here, we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside the house came the sound of a pistol shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet, which ricocheting from the top of the embrasure, struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet. Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did so, we heard Mr. Morris' voice without. Sorry, I fear I have alarmed you. I shall come in and tell you about it. A minute later, he came in and said, It was an idiotic thing of me to do, and I ask your pardon, Mrs. Harker, most sincerely. I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is that whilst the professor was talking, there came a big bat and sat on the window sill. I have got such a horror of the damned brutes from recent events that I cannot stand them, and I went out to have a shot, as I have been doing late of evenings, whenever I have seen one. You used to laugh at me for it then, Art. Did you hit it? asked Dr. Van Helsing. I don't know. I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood. Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. We must trace each of these boxes, and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair, or we must, so to speak, sterilise the earth, so that no more he can seek safely in it. Thus, in the end, we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset, and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. And now for you, Madam Mina, this night is end, until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such risk. When we part tonight, you no more must question. We are men, and are able to bear, but you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in danger, such as we are. All the men, even Jonathan, seemed relieved, but it did not seem to me good that they should brave danger and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety through care of me. But their minds were made up, and though it was a bitter pill for me to swallow, I could say nothing save to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. As there is no time to lose, I vote we have a look at his house right now, 
Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim. I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close, but I did not say anything, for I had a greater fear that if I appeared as a drag or a hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of their counsels altogether. They have now gone off to Carfax with means to get into the house. Manlike, they had told me to go to bed and sleep, as if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger. I shall lie down and pretend to sleep, lest Jonathan have added anxiety about me when he returns. Dr. Seward's diary, 1st of October, 4am. Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say that I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. I don't know but what, if you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits. I knew the man would not have said this without some cause, so I said, All right, I'll go now, and I asked the others to wait a few minutes for me, as I had to go and see my patient. Take me with you, friends John, said the professor. His case in your diary interests me much, and it had bearing too now and again on our case. I should much like to see him, and especially when his mind is disturbed. May I come along also? asked Lord Godalming. Me too, said Quincy Morris. May I come, said Harker. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I had ever seen in a lunatic, and he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail, with others entirely sane. We all five went into the room, but none of the others at first said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. This he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery and deducing his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. They will perhaps not mind sitting in judgment on my case. By the way, you have not introduced me. I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum did not strike me at the moment, and besides, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner, so much of the habit of equality, that I at once made the introduction. Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing... Mr. Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr. Jonathan Harker, Mr. Renfield. He shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming, I had the honour of seconding your father at the Wyndham. I grieve to know, by your holding the title, that he is no more. He was a man loved and honoured by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of a burnt rum punch, much patronised on Derby night. Mr. Morris, you should be proud of your great state. Its reception into the Union was a precedent which may have far-reaching effects hereafter, when the Pole and the Tropics may hold alliance for the Stars and Stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement, when the Monroe Doctrine takes its true place in the political fable. What shall any man say of his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionised therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You, gentlemen, who by nationality, by heredity, or by the possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world, I take to witness that I am sane, as at least the majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties. And I am sure that you, Dr. Seward, humanitarian and medico-jurist, as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered as under exceptional circumstances. He made this last appeal with a courtly air of conviction which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered. For my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored, and I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity, and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I thought it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement, for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes. This did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, But I fear, Dr. Seward, that you hardly apprehend my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may, 
time presses, and in our implied agreement with the old scytheman, it is of the essence of the contract. I am sure it is only necessary to put before so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward so simple, yet so momentous a wish, to ensure its fulfilment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing the negative in my face, turned to the others, and scrutinised them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on. Is it possible I have erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly, but at the same time, as I felt, brutally. There was a considerable pause, and then he said slowly, Then I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession, boon, privilege, whatever you will. I am content to implore in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones, unsound and unselfish, and spring from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, sir, into my heart, you would approve to the full the sentiments which animate me. Nay, more, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friends. Again he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another phase of his madness, and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of utmost intensity, his bushy eyebrows almost meeting with the fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield, in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as of one addressing an equal, "'Can you not tell frankly your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that if you will satisfy even me, a stranger without prejudice, and with a habit of keeping an open mind, Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk and his own responsibility, the privilege you seek.' He shook his head sadly, and with a look of poignant regret on his face, the professor went on, "'Come, sir, bethink yourself. "'You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree, "'since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. "'You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, "'since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. "'If you will not help us in our effort to choose the wisest course, "'how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? "'Be wise and help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish.' "'He still shook his head as he said,' Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete, and if I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment, but I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave, so I went towards the door, simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door... A new change came over the patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared he was about to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless, for he held up his two hands imploringly and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotion was mitigating against him, by storing us more to our old relations, he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes, so it became a little more fixed in my manner if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. I had previously seen something of the same constantly growing excitement in him when he had to make some request of which at the time he had thought much, such, for instance, as when he wanted a cat, and I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. My expectation was not realised, for when he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on to his knees and held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication, and poured forth a torrent of entreaty, with the tears rolling down his cheeks, and his whole face and form expressive of the deepest emotion. "'Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward. Oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Send me away, how you will, and where you will. Send keepers with me, with whips and chains. Let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacled and leg-ironed, even to jail. But let me go out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I'm speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. You don't know whom you wrong, or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me, I may not tell. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, by your love that is lost, by your hope that lives, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. 
Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that I am sane and earnest now? That I am no lunatic in a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul? Oh, hear me! Hear me! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit. So I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly. No more of this. We have had quite enough already. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intently for several moments. Then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasions, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, last of our party, he said to me in a quiet, well-bred voice, "You will, I trust, Doctor Seward." Do me the justice to bear in mind later on that I did what I could to convince you tonight. End of chapter eighteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster. www.alexfoster.me.uk. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 19. Jonathan Harker's Journal. 1st of October, 5 a.m. I went with the party to the search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I'm so glad that she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Somehow it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all, but now that her work is done, and that it is due to her energy and brains and foresight that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells, she may well feel that her part is finished, and she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, all a little upset by the scene with Mr. Renfield. When we came away from his room, we were silent till we got back to the study. Then Mr. Morris said to Dr. Seward, "'Say, Jack, if that man wasn't attempting a bluff, he is about the sanest lunatic I ever saw.' I am not sure, but I believe he had some serious purpose, and if he had, it was pretty rough on him not to get a chance. Lord Godalming and I were silent, but Dr. Van Helsing added, Friend John, you know more about lunatics than I do, and I am glad of it, for I fear that if it had been me to decide, I would before that last hysterical outburst have given him free. But we live and learn, and in our present task we must take no chance, as my friend Quincy would say. All is best as they are. Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. I don't know, but that I agree with you. If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him. But he seems so mixed up with the Count in an indexy kind of way that I'm afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he prayed with almost equal fervour for a cat, then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master, and he may want to get out and help him in some diabolical way. That horrid thing has the wolves and rats and his own kind to help him, so I suppose he isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly did seem earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best. These things, in conjunction with the wild work we have in hand, help to unnerve a man. The professor stepped over, and laying his hand on his shoulder, said in his grave, kindly way, "'Friend John, have no fear. We are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case.' We can only do as we deem best. What else have we to hope for, except the pity of the good God? Lord Godalming had slipped away for a few minutes, but now he returned. He held up a little silver whistle, as he remarked. That old place may be full of rats, and if so, I've got an antidote on call. Having passed the wall, we took our way to the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight shone out. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag, and took out a lot of things which he laid on the step, sorting them into four little groups, evidently one for each. Then he spoke. My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need arms of many kinds. Our enemy is not merely spiritual. Remember that he has the strength of twenty men, and that though our necks or our windpipes are of the common kind, and therefore breakable or crushable, his are not amenable to mere strength. A stronger man or a body of men, more strong in all than him, can at certain times hold him, but they cannot hurt him as we can be hurt by him. We must therefore guard ourselves from his touch. 
Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he lifted a small silver crucifix, and held it out to me, I being nearest to him. Put these flowers round your neck. Here he handed me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. For other enemies more mundane, this revolver and this knife, and for aid in all, these so small electrical lamps, which you can fasten to your breast, and for all, and above all at the last, this, which we must not desecrate needless. This was a portion of sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Now, he said, friend John, where are the skeleton keys? If we can open the door, we need not break into the house by the window, as before at Miss Lucy's. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys, his mechanical dexterity as a surgeon, standing him in good stead. Presently he got one to suit. After a little play back and forward, the bolt yielded, and with a rusty clang shot back. We pressed on the door, the rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. It was startling like the image conveyed to me in Dr. Seward's diary of the opening of Miss Westenra's tomb. I fancied that the same idea appeared to strike the others, for with one accord they shrank back. The professor was the first to move forward, and he stepped into the open door. "'In manus tuas, Domine,' he said, crossing himself as we passed over the threshold. We closed the door behind us, lest when we should have lit our lamps we should possibly attract attention from the road. The professor carefully tried the lock, lest we might not be able to open it from within should we be in a hurry making our exit. Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded on our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell in all sorts of odd forms, as the rays crossed each other, or the opacity of our bodies through great shadows. I could not for my life get away from the feeling that there was someone else amongst us. I suppose it was the recollection so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings of that terrible experience in Transylvania. I think the feeling was common to us all, for I noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every new shadow, just as I felt myself doing. The whole place was thick with dust. The floor was seemingly inches deep, except where there were recent footsteps, in which on holding down my lamp I could see marks of hobnails where the dust was cracked. The walls were fluffy and heavy with dust, and in the corners were masses of spiders' webs, whereon the dust had gathered till they looked like old tattered rags as the weight had torn them partly down. On a table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with a time-yellowed label on each. They had been used several times, for on the table were several similar rents in the blanket of dust, similar to that exposed when the professor lifted them. He turned to me and said, "'You know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it, and you know it at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel?' I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it. So I led the way, and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low, arched oaken door, ribbed with iron bands. "'This is the spot,' said the professor as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house, copied from the file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door a faint, malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gaps. But none of us ever expected such an odour as we encountered. None of the others had met the Count at all at close quarters, and when I had seen him he was either in the fasting stage of his existence in his rooms, or when he was bloated with fresh blood, in a ruined building open to the air. But here the place was small and close, and the long disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell as of some dry miasma which came through the fouler air. But as to the odour itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills of mortality, and with the pungent, acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. Ugh! Oh, it sickens me to think of it. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances, such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end. But this was no ordinary case, and the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us a strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent on the first nauseous whiff, 
we one and all set about our work as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, the first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. We must then examine every hole and corner and cranny, and see if we cannot get some clue as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. Once I got a fright, for, seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door into the dark passage beyond, I looked too, and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the highlights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for, as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows, and resumed his inquiry, I turned my lamp in the direction and stepped into the passage. There was no sign of anyone, and as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind, but only the solid walls of the passage, there could be no hiding place even for him. I took it that fear had helped imagination, and said nothing. A few moments later I saw Morris step suddenly back from a corner which he was examining. We all followed his movements with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us, and we saw a whole mass of phosphorescence which twinkled like stars. We all instinctively drew back. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, and which I had seen myself, he turned the key in the lock drew the huge bolts, and swung the door open. Then, taking his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and after about a minute three terriers came dashing round the corner of the house. Unconsciously we had all moved towards the door, and as we moved I noticed that the dust had been much disturbed. The boxes which had been taken out had been brought this way but even in the minute that had elapsed the number of the rats had vastly increased. They seemed to swarm over the place all at once, till the lamplight, shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering baleful eyes, made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies. The dogs dashed on, but at the threshold suddenly stopped and snarled, and then, simultaneously lifting their noses, began to howl in most lugubrious fashion. The rats were multiplying in thousands, and we moved out. Lord Godalming lifted one of the dogs, and carrying him in, placed him on the floor. The instant his feet touched the ground he seemed to recover his courage and rushed at his natural enemies. They fled before him so fast that before he had shaken the life out of a score, the other dogs, who had by now been lifted in the same manner, had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished. With their going it seemed as if some evil presence had departed for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts at their prostrate foes, and turned them over and over and tossed them in the air with vicious shakes. We all seemed to find our spirits rise. Whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere by the opening of the chapel door, or the relief we experienced by finding ourselves in the open, I know not, but most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe, and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance, though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution. We closed the outer door and barred and locked it, and bringing the dogs with us began our search of the house. We found nothing throughout except dust in extraordinary proportions, and all untouched save for my own footsteps when I had made my first visit. Never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness, and even when we returned to the chapel they frisked about as though they had been rabbit-hunting in a summer wood. The morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front. Dr. Van Helsing had taken the key of the hall door from the bunch, and locked the door in orthodox fashion, putting the key into his pocket, when he had done. "'So far,' he said, "'our night has been eminently successful. No harm has come to us such as I feared might be, and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. More than all do I rejoice that this, our first and perhaps our most difficult and dangerous step, has been accomplished, without bringing therein to our most sweet Madame Mina.' or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget. One lesson, too, we have learned, 
if it be allowable to argue a particulari, that the brute beasts which are at the Count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spiritual power. For look, these rats that would come to his call, just as from his castle-top he summoned the wolves to your going, and to that poor mother's cry, though they come to him, they run pell-mell from the so little dogs of my friend Arthur. We have other matters before us, other dangers, other fears, and that monster. He has not used his power over the brute world for the only or the last time to-night. So be it that he has gone elsewhere. Good. It has given us opportunity to cry check in some ways in this check game, which we play for the stake of human souls. Now let us go home. The dawn is close at hand, and we have reason to be content with our first night's work. It may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow, if full of peril, but we must go on, and from no danger shall we shrink. The house was silent when we got back, save for some poor creature who was screaming away in one of the distant wards, and a low moaning sound from Renfield's room. The poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself after the manner of the insane, with needless thoughts of pain. I came tiptoe into our own room, and found Mina asleep, breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it. She looked paler than usual. I hope the meeting to-night has not upset her. I am truly thankful that she is to be left out of our future work, and even of our deliberations. It is too great a strain for a woman to bear. I did not think so at first, but I know better now. Therefore I am glad that it is settled. There may be things which would frighten her to hear, and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell her if once she suspected that there was any concealment. Henceforth our work is to be a sealed book to her till at least such time as we can tell her that all is finished, and the earth free from a monster of the netherworld. I dare say it will be difficult to begin to keep silence after such confidence as ours, but I must be resolute, and to-morrow I shall keep dark over to-night's doings, and shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened. I rest on the sofa so as not to disturb her. 1st of October, later. I suppose it was natural that we should all have overslept ourselves, for the day was a busy one, and the night had no rest at all. Even Mina must have felt his exhaustion, for though I slept till the sun was high, I was awake before her, and had to call two or three times before she awoke. Indeed, she was so sound asleep that for a few seconds she did not recognise me, but looked at me with a sort of blank terror, as one looks who has been waked out of a bad dream. She complained a little of being tired, and I let her rest till later in the day. We now know of twenty-one boxes having been removed, and if it be that several were taken in any of these removals, we may be able to trace them all. Such will, of course, immensely simplify our labour, and the sooner the matter is attended to, the better. I shall look up Thomas Snelling to-day. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st of October. It was towards noon, when I was awakened by the professor walking into my room. He was more jolly and cheerful than usual, and it is quite evident that last night's work has helped take some of the brooding weight off his mind. After going over the adventure of the night, he suddenly said, "'Your patient interests me much. May it be that with you I visit him this morning? Or if that you are too occupied, I can go alone if it may be. It is a new experience to me to find a lunatic who talks philosophy and reason so sound.' I had some work to do which pressed, so I told him that if he would go alone, I would be glad, as then I should not have to keep him waiting. So I called an attendant, and gave him the necessary instructions. Before the professor left the room, I cautioned him against getting any false impression from my patient. But, he answered, I want to talk to him of himself and of his delusion as to consuming live things. He said to Madame Mina, as I see in your diary of yesterday, that he had once had such a belief. Why do you smile, friend John? Excuse me, I said, but the answer is here. I laid my hand on the typewritten matter. When our sane and learned lunatic made that very statement of how he used to consume life, his mouth was actually nauseous with the flies and spiders which he had eaten just before Mrs. Harker entered the room. Van Helsing smiled in turn. Good, he said, your memory is true, friend John. I should have remembered. And yet it is this very obliquity of thought and memory which makes mental disease such a fascinating study. Perhaps I may gain more knowledge out of the folly of this madman than I shall from teaching of the most wise. Who knows? I went on with my work, 
and before long was through that in hand. It seemed that the time had been very short indeed, but there was Van Helsing back in the study. "'Do I interrupt?' he asked politely as he stood at the door. "'Not at all,' I answered. "'Come in. My work is finished and I am free. I can go with you now, if you like.' "'It is needless. I have seen him.' "'Well?' "'I fear that he does not appraise me at much. Our interview was short. When I entered his room he was sitting on a stool in the centre with his elbows on his knees, and his face was the picture of sullen discontent. I spoke to him as cheerfully as I could, and with such a measure of respect as I could assume. He made no reply whatever. "'Don't you know me?' I asked. His answer was not reassuring. "'I know you well enough. You are the old fool Van Helsing. I wish you would take yourself and your idiotic brain theories somewhere else. Damn all thick-headed Dutchmen!' Not a word more would he say, but sat in his implacable sullenness, as indifferent to me as though I had not been in the room at all. Thus departed for this time, my chance of much learning from this so clever lunatic, so I shall go, if I may, and cheer myself with a few happy words with that sweet soul, Madame Mina. Friend John, it does rejoice me unspeakably that she is no more to be pained, no more to be worried with our terrible things. Though we shall much miss her help, it is better so. I agree with you. "'With all my heart,' I answered earnestly, for I did not want him to weaken in this matter. "'Mrs. Harker is better out of it. Things are quite bad enough for us, all men of the world, and who have been in many tight places in our time. But it is no place for a woman, and if she had remained in touch with the affair, it would in time infallibly have wrecked her. "'So Van Helsing has gone to confer with Mrs. Harker and Harker. Quincy and Art are all out following up the clues as to the earth boxes. I shall finish my round of work, and we shall meet to-night.' Mina Harker's Journal 1st of October It is strange to me to be kept in the dark as I am to-day, after Jonathan's full confidence for so many years, to see him manifestly avoid certain matters, and those are the most vital of all. This morning I slept late after the fatigues of yesterday, and though Jonathan was late too, he was the earlier. He spoke to me before he went out, never more sweetly or tenderly, but he never mentioned a word of what had happened in the visit to the Count's house. And yet he must have known how terribly anxious I was. Poor dear fellow, I suppose it must have distressed him even more than it did me. They all agreed that it was best that I should not be drawn further into this awful work, and I acquiesced. But to think that he keeps anything from me! And now I am crying like a silly fool, when I know it comes from my husband's great love and from the good, good wishes of those other strong men." That has done me good. Well, some day Jonathan will tell me all. And lest it should ever be that he should think for a moment that I kept anything from him, I still keep my journal as usual. Then, if he is feared of my trust, I shall show it to him, with every thought of my heart, put down for his dear eyes to read. I feel strangely sad and low-spirited today. I suppose it is the reaction from the terrible excitement. Last night I went to bed when the men had gone, simply because they told me to. I didn't feel sleepy, and I did feel full of devouring anxiety. I kept thinking over everything that has been ever since Jonathan came to see me in London, and it all seems like a horrible tragedy, with fate pressing on relentlessly to some destined end. Everything that one does seems, no matter how right it may be, to bring on the very thing which is most to be deplored. If I hadn't gone to Whitby, perhaps poor dear Lucy would be with us now. She hadn't taken to visiting the churchyard till I came, and if she hadn't come there in the daytime with me she wouldn't have walked in her sleep, and if she hadn't gone there at night and asleep that monster wouldn't have destroyed her as he did. Oh, why did I ever go to Whitby? There now, crying again. I wonder what has come over me today. I must hide it from Jonathan, for if he knew that I had been crying twice in one morning, I, who never cried on my own account and whom he has never caused to shed a tear, the dear fellow would fret his heart out. I shall put a bold face on, and if I do feel weepy, he shall never see it. I suppose it is just one of the lessons that we poor women have to learn. I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs and a lot of queer sounds, like praying on a very tumultuous scale from Mr. Renfield's room, which is somewhere under this. And then there was silence over everything, silence so profound that it startled me, and I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent, the black shadows thrown by the moonlight seeming full of a silent mystery of their own. Not a thing seemed to be stirring, 
but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate, so that a thin streak of white mist, that crept with almost imperceptible slowness across the grass towards the house, seemed to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I think that the digression of my thoughts must have done me good, for when I got back to bed I found a lethargy creeping over me. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got out and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading, and was now close up to the house, so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it was stealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognise in his tones some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was the sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed and pulled the clothes over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy, at least so I thought, but I must have fallen asleep, for except dreams, I do not remember anything until the morning when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and a little time to realise where I was, and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, and was almost typical of the way that waking thoughts become merged in or continued in dreams. I thought that I was asleep, and waiting for Jonathan to come back. I was very anxious about him, and I was powerless to act. My feet and my hands and my brain were weighted, so that nothing could proceed at the usual pace. And so I slept uneasily and thought. Then it began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dank and cold. I put back the clothes from my face, and found to my surprise that all was dim around. The gaslight, which I had left lit for Jonathan, but turned down, came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I had shut the window before I had come to bed. I would have got out to make certain on the point, but some leaden lethargy seemed to chain my limbs and even my will. I lay still and endured, that was all. I closed my eyes, but could still see through my eyelids. It is wonderful what tricks our dreams play us, and how conveniently we can imagine. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in, for I could see it like smoke, or with the white energy of boiling water, pouring in not through the window, but through the joinings of the door. It got thicker and thicker, till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see the light of the gas, shining like a red eye. Things began to whirl through my brain, just as the cloudy column was now whirling in the room, and through it all came the scriptural words, a pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. Was it indeed such spiritual guidance that was coming to me in my sleep? But the pillar was composed of both the day and the night guiding, for the fire was in the red eye, which at the thought got a new fascination for me, till, as I looked, the fire divided, and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes, such as Lucy told me of in her momentary mental wandering, when, on the cliff, the dying sunlight struck the windows of St. Mary's Church. Suddenly the horror burst upon me that it was thus that Jonathan had seen those awful women growing into reality through the whirling mist in the moonlight, and in my dream I must have fainted, for all became black darkness. The last conscious effort which my imagination made was to show me a livid white face bending over me out of the mist. I must be careful of such dreams, for they would unseat one's reason if there were too much of them. I would get Dr. Van Helsing or Dr. Seward to prescribe something for me which would make me sleep, only that I fear to alarm them. Such a dream at the present time would become woven into their fears for me. Tonight I shall strive hard to sleep naturally. If I do not, I shall tomorrow night get them to give me a dose of chloral that cannot hurt me for once, and it will give me a good night's sleep. Last night tired me more than if I had not slept at all. 2nd of October, 10 p.m. Last night I slept, but did not dream. I must have slept soundly, for I was not waked by Jonathan coming to bed, but the sleep has not refreshed me, for today I feel terribly weak and spiritless. I spent all yesterday trying to read, or lying down dozing. In the afternoon Mr. Renfield asked if he might see me. Poor man, he was very gentle, and when I came away he kissed my hand and bade God bless me. Some way it affected me much. I am crying when I think of him. This is a new weakness of which I must be careful. Jonathan would be miserable if he knew I had been crying. He and the others were out till dinner-time, and they all came in tired. 
I did what I could to brighten them up, and I supposed that the effort did me good, for I forgot how tired I was. After dinner they sent me to bed, and all went off to smoke together, as they said, but I knew that they wanted to tell each other of what had occurred to each other during the day. I could see from Jonathan's manner that he had something important to communicate. I was not so sleepy as I should have been, so before they went I asked Dr. Seward to give me a little opiate of some kind, as I had not slept well the night before. He very kindly made up a sleeping draught, which he gave to me, telling me that it would do me no harm, as it was very mild. I have taken it, and am waiting for sleep, which still keeps aloof. I hope I have not done wrong, for as sleep begins to flirt with me a new fear comes, that I may have been foolish in thus depriving myself of the power of waking. I might want it. Here comes sleep. Good night. End of chapter 19 Read in Nottingham, England, on the 28th of January, 2006, by Alex Foster. www.alexfoster.me.uk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit... LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul S. Jenkins of the Rev Up Review. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 20. Jonathan Harker's Journal. 1st October, evening. I found Thomas Snelling in his house at Bethnal Green but unhappily he was not in a condition to remember anything. The very prospect of beer which my expected coming had opened to him had proved too much, and he had begun too early on his expected debauch. I learned, however, from his wife, who seemed a decent, poor soul, that he was only the assistant of Smollett, who of the two mates was the responsible person. So off I drove to Walworth, and found Mr. Joseph Smollett at home, and in his shirt-sleeves, taking a late tea out of a saucer. He is a decent, intelligent fellow, distinctly a good, reliable type of workman, and with a headpiece of his own. He remembered all about the incident of the boxes, and from a wonderful dog-eared notebook, which he produced from some mysterious receptacle about the seat of his trousers, and which had hieroglyphical entries in thick, half-obliterated pencil, he gave me the destinations of the boxes. There were, he said, six in the cartload which he took from Carfax and left at 197 Chicksand Street, Mile End, New Town, and another six which he deposited at Jamaica Lane, Bermondsey. If, then, the Count meant to scatter these ghastly refuges of his over London, these places were chosen as the first of delivery— so that later he might distribute more fully. The systematic manner in which this was done made me think that he could not mean to confine himself to two sides of London. He was now fixed on the far east on the northern shore, on the east of the southern shore, and on the south. The north and west were surely never meant to be left out of his diabolical scheme, let alone the city itself and the very heart of fashionable London in the south-west and west. I went back to Smollett, and asked him if he could tell us if any other boxes had been taken from Carfax. He replied, "'Well, Governor, you've treated me very handsome.' I had given him half a sovereign. "'And I'll tell you all I know. I heard a man by the name of Bloxham say four nights ago in the air and ounds, in Pincher's Alley, as how he and his mate had had a rare dusty job in an old house at Purfleet. There ain't a many such jobs as this here.' "'and I'm thinking that maybe Sam Bloxham could tell you summat. "'I asked if he could tell me where to find him. "'I told him that if he could get me the address "'it would be worth another half-sovereign to him. "'So he gulped down the rest of his tea and stood up, "'saying that he was going to begin the search then and there. "'At the door he stopped and said, "'Look here, Governor, there ain't no sense in me a keeping you here. "'I may find Sam soon, or I mayn't. "'But anyhow,' "'He ain't like to be in a way to tell you much tonight. "'Sam is a rare one when he starts on the booze. 
If you can give me an envelope with a stamp on it, and put your address on it, I'll find out where Sam is to be found and post it you tonight. But you'd better be up arter him soon in the morning, never mind the booze the night afore. This was all practical. So one of the children went off with a penny to buy an envelope and a sheet of paper, and to keep the change. When she came back, I addressed the envelope and stamped it, and when Smollett had again faithfully promised to post the address when found, I took my way to home. We're on the track, anyhow. I am tired tonight, and I want to sleep. Mina is fast asleep, and looks a little too pale. Her eyes look as though she had been crying. Poor dear, I've no doubt it frets her to be kept in the dark. And it may make her doubly anxious about me and the others. But it is best as it is. It is better to be disappointed and worried in such a way now than to have her nerve broken. The doctors were quite right to insist on her being kept out of this dreadful business. I must be firm, for on me this particular burden of silence must rest. I shall not ever enter on the subject with her under any circumstances. Indeed, it may not be a hard task, after all, for she herself has become reticent on the subject, and has not spoken of the Count or his doings ever since we told her of our decision. 2nd October. Evening. A long and trying and exciting day. By the first post I got my directed envelope with a dirty scrap of paper enclosed, on which was written with a carpenter's pencil in a sprawling hand, Sam Bloxham, Corcoran's, 4 Poters Court, Bartell Street, Woolworth. Ask for the depite. I got the letter in bed and rose without waking Mina. She looked heavy and sleepy and pale and far from well. I determined not to wake her, but that when I should return from this new search, I would arrange for her going back to Exeter. I think she would be happier in our own home, with her daily tasks to interest her, than in being here amongst us and in ignorance. I only saw Dr. Seward for a moment, and told him where I was off to, promising to come back and tell the rest so soon as I should have found out anything. I drove to Walworth and found, with some difficulty, Potter's Court. Mr. Smollett's spelling misled me, as I asked for Potter's Court instead of Potter's Court. However, when I had found the court, I had no difficulty in discovering Corcoran's lodging house. When I asked the man who came to the door for the depite, he shook his head and said, I don't know him. There ain't no such person here. I never heard of him in all my blooming days. Don't believe there ain't nobody of that kind living here or anywheres. I took out Smollett's letter, and as I read it, it seemed to me that the lesson of the spelling of the name of the court might guide me. What are you? I asked. I'm the deputy, he answered. I saw at once that I was on the right track. Phonetic spelling had again misled me. A half-crown tip put the deputy's knowledge at my disposal, and I learned that Mr. Bloxham, who had slept off the remains of his beer on the previous night at Corcoran's, had left for his work at Poplar at five o'clock that morning. He could not tell me where the place of work was situated, but he had a vague idea that it was some kind of a newfangled werus, and with this slender clue I had to start for Poplar. It was twelve o'clock before I got any satisfactory hint of such a building and this I got at a coffee-shop, where some workmen were having their dinner. One of them suggested that there was being erected at Cross Angel Street a new cold storage building, and as this suited the condition of a new-fangled wearus, I at once drove to it. An interview with a surly gatekeeper and a surlier foreman, both of whom were appeased with the coin of the realm, put me on the track of Bloxham. He was sent for, on my suggestion that I was willing to pay his day's wages to his foreman for the privilege of asking him a few questions on a private matter. He was a smart enough fellow, though rough of speech and bearing. When I had promised to pay for his information and given him an earnest, he told me that he had made two journeys between Carfax and a house in Piccadilly, and had taken from this house to the latter nine great boxes, main heavy ones 
with a horse and cart hired by him for this purpose. I asked him if he could tell me the number of the house in Piccadilly, to which he replied, "'Well, Governor, I forgets the number, but it was only a few door from a big white church, or something of the kind, not long built. It was a dusty old house, too, though nothing to the dustiness of the house we took the blooming boxes from. How did you get in if both houses were empty?' There was the old party that engaged me a waiting at the house at Purfleet. He helped me to lift the boxes and put them in the dray. Curse me, but he was the strongest chap I ever struck, and him an old fellow with a white moustache, one that thin you would think he couldn't throw a shadder. How this phrase thrilled through me. Why, he took up his end of the boxes like they was pounds of tea, and me a puffin' and a blowin' afore I could up in mine anyhow, and I'm no chicken neither. How did you get into the house in Piccadilly? I asked. He was there too. He must have started off and got there afore me, for when I rung the bell he came and opened the door himself and helped me carry the boxes into the hall. The whole nine? I asked. Yes. There was five in the first load and four in the second. It was main dry work and I don't so well remember how I got home. I interrupted him. Were the boxes left in the hall? Yes, it was a big hall and there was nothing else in it. I made one more attempt to further matters. You didn't have any key? Never used no key nor nothing. The old gent, he opened the door hisself and shut it again when I drove off. I don't remember the last time, but that was the beer. And you can't remember the number of the house? No, sir. But you needn't have no difficulty about that. It's a iron with a stone front with a bow on it, and I steps up to the door. I know them steps, having had to carry the boxes up with three loafers that come round to earn a copper. The old gent give em shillings, and they seeing they got so much, they wanted more. But he took one of them by the shoulder and was like to throw him down the steps till the lot of them went away cussing. I thought that with this description I could find the house. So having paid my friend for his information, I started off for Piccadilly. I had gained a new painful experience. The Count could, it was evident, handle the earth-boxes himself. If so, time was precious, for now that he had achieved a certain amount of distribution, he could, by choosing his own time, complete the task unobserved. At Piccadilly Circus I discharged my cab and walked westward. Beyond the junior constitutional I came across the house described and was satisfied that this was the next of the lairs arranged by Dracula. The house looked as though it had been long untenanted. The windows were encrusted with dust, and the shutters were up. All the framework was black with time, and from the iron the paint had mostly scaled away. It was evident that up to lately there had been a large notice-board in front of the balcony. It had, however, been roughly torn away, the uprights which had supported it still remaining. Behind the rails of the balcony... I saw there were some loose boards, whose raw edges looked white. I would have given a good deal to have been able to see the notice-board intact, as it would, perhaps, have given some clue to the ownership of the house. I remembered my experience of the investigation and purchase of Carfax, and I could not but feel that if I could find the former owner there might be some means discovered of gaining access to the house. There was at present nothing to be learned from the Piccadilly side, and nothing could be done, so I went around the back to see if anything could be gathered from this quarter. The mews were active, the Piccadilly houses being mostly in occupation. I asked one or two of the grooms and helpers whom I saw around if they could tell me anything about the empty house. One of them said that he heard it had lately been taken, but he couldn't say from whom. He told me, however, that up to very lately there had been a notice-board of For Sale up and that perhaps Mitchell, Sons and Candy, the house agents, could tell me something, as he thought he remembered seeing the name of that firm on the board. I did not wish to seem too eager, or to let my informant know or guess too much. So thanking him in the usual manner, I strolled away. It was now growing dusk, and the autumn night was closing in, so I did not lose any time. Having learned the address of Mitchell, Sons and Candy from a directory at the Barclay, I was soon at their office in Sackville Street. The gentleman who saw me was particularly suave in manner, but uncommunicative in equal proportion. 
having once told me that the Piccadilly house, which throughout our interview he called a mansion, was sold, he considered my business as concluded. When I asked who had purchased it, he opened his eyes a thought wider, and paused a few seconds before replying, "'It is sold, sir.' "'Pardon me,' I said, with equal politeness, "'but I have a special reason for wishing to know who purchased it.' Again he paused longer, and raised his eyebrows still more. "'It is sold, sir,' was again his laconic reply. "'Surely,' I said, "'you do not mind letting me know so much.' "'But I do mind,' he answered. "'The affairs of their clients are absolutely safe in the hands of Mitchell, Sons and Candy.' This was manifestly a prig of the first water, and there was no use arguing with him. I thought I had best meet him on his own ground, so I said, "'Your clients, sir, are happy in having so resolute a guardian of their confidence. I am myself a professional man.' Here I handed him my card. "'In this instance I am not prompted by curiosity. I act on the part of Lord Godalming.' who wishes to know something of the property which was, he understood, lately for sale. These words put a different complexion on affairs. He said, "'I would like to oblige you if I could, Mr. Harker, and especially would I like to oblige his lordship. We once carried out a small matter of renting some chambers for him when he was the Honourable Arthur Homewood. If you will let me have his lordship's address, I will consult the house on the subject, and will, in any case, communicate with his lordship by tonight's post. It will be a pleasure if we can so far deviate from our rules as to give the required information to his lordship. I wanted to secure a friend and not make an enemy, so I thanked him, gave the address at Dr. Seward's, and came away. It was now dark, and I was tired and hungry. I got a cup of tea at the aerated bread company and came down to Purfleet by the next train. I found all the others at home. Mina was looking tired and pale, but she made a gallant effort to be bright and cheerful. It wrung my heart to think that I had had to keep anything from her and so caused her inquietude. Thank God this will be the last night of her looking on at our conferences and feeling the sting of our not showing our confidence. It took all my courage to hold to the wise resolution of keeping her out of our grim task. She seems somehow more reconciled, or else the very subject seems to have become repugnant to her, for when any accidental allusion is made, she actually shudders. I am glad we made our resolution in time, as with such a feeling as this, our growing knowledge would be torture to her. I could not tell the others of the day's discovery till we were alone. So after dinner, followed by a little music to save appearances, even amongst ourselves, I took Mina to her room and left her to go to bed. The dear girl was more affectionate with me than ever, and clung to me as though she would detain me. But there was much to be talked of, and I came away. Thank God the ceasing of telling things has made no difference between us. When I came down again I found the others all gathered round the fire in the study. In the train I had written my diary so far, and simply read it off to them as the best means of letting them get abreast of my own information. When I had finished, Van Helsing said, "'This has been a great day's work, friend Jonathan. Doubtless we are on the track of the missing boxes. If we find them all in that house, then our work is near the end. But if there be some missing, we must search until we find them.' Then shall we make our final coup, and hunt the wretch to his real death. We all sat silent a while, and all at once Mr. Norris spoke. Say, how are we going to get into that house? We got into the other, answered Lord Godalming quickly. But, Art, this is different. We broke house at Carfax, but we had night and a walled park to protect us. It will be a mighty different thing to commit burglary in Piccadilly, either by day or night. I confess I don't see how we are going to get in unless that agency duck can find us a key of some sort. Lord Godalming's brows contracted, and he stood up and walked about the room. By and by he stopped and said, turning from one to another of us, Quincy's head is level. This burglary business is getting serious. We got off once all right, but we have now a rare job on hand, unless we can find the Count's key-basket. 
as nothing could well be done before morning, and as it would be at least advisable to wait till Lord Godalming should hear from Mitchell's, we decided not to take any active step before breakfast time. For a good while we sat and smoked, discussing the matter in its various lights and bearings. I took the opportunity of bringing this diary right up to the moment. I am very sleepy, and shall go to bed. Just a line. Mina sleeps soundly, and her breathing is regular. Her forehead is puckered up into little wrinkles, as though she thinks even in her sleep. She is still too pale, but does not look so haggard as she did this morning. Tomorrow will, I hope, mend all this. She will be herself at home in Exeter. Oh, but I am sleepy. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st October I am puzzled afresh about Renfield. His moods change so rapidly that I find it difficult to keep touch of them. And as they always mean something more than his own well-being, they form a more than interesting study. This morning, when I went to see him after his repulse of Van Helsing, his manner was that of a man commanding destiny. He was, in fact, commanding destiny, subjectively. He did not really care for any of the things of mere earth. He was in the clouds and looked down on all the weaknesses and wants of us poor mortals. I thought I would improve the occasion and learn something, so I asked him, "'What about the flies these times?' He smiled on me in quite a superior sort of way, such a smile as would have become the face of Malvolio, as he answered me. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic faculties. The ancients did well when they typified the soul as a butterfly. I thought I would push his analogy to its utmost logically. So I said quickly, Oh, it is a soul you are after now, is it? His madness foiled his reason, and a puzzled look spread over his face as, shaking his head with a decision which I had but seldom seen in him, he said, "'Oh, no! Oh, no! I want no souls. Life is all I want.' Here he brightened up. "'I am pretty indifferent about it at present. Life is all right. I have all I want. You must get a new patient, doctor, if you wish to study zoophagy.' This puzzled me a little, so I drew him on. "'Then you command life. You are a god, I suppose.' He smiled with an ineffably benign superiority. "'Oh, no! Far be it from me to arrogate to myself the attributes of the deity. I am not even concerned in his especially spiritual doings. If I may state my intellectual position, I am, so far as concerns things purely terrestrial, somewhat in the position which Enoch occupied spiritually.' this was a poser to me. I could not at the moment recall Enoch's appositeness, so I had to ask a simple question, though I felt that by so doing I was lowering myself in the eyes of the lunatic. And why with Enoch? Because he walked with God. I could not see the analogy, but did not like to admit it, so I harked back to what he had denied. So you don't care about life, and you don't want souls. Why not? I put my question quickly and somewhat sternly, on purpose to disconcert him. The effort succeeded. For an instant he unconsciously relapsed into his old servile manner, bent low before me, and actually fawned upon me as he replied, "'I don't want any souls, indeed, indeed, I don't. I couldn't use them if I had them. They would be no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them, or—' He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face." like a wind-sweep on the surface of the water. And, Doctor, as to life, what is it, after all, when you've got all you require, and you know that you will never want, that is all? I have friends, good friends, like you, Dr. Seward. This was said with a leer of inexpressible cunning. I know that I shall never lack the means of life. I think that through the cloudiness of his insanity he saw some antagonism in me, for he at once fell back on the last refuge of such as he, a dogged silence. After a short time I saw that for the present it was useless to speak to him. He was sulky, and so I came away. Later in the day he sent for me. Ordinarily I would not have come without special reason. 
but just at present I am so interested in him that I would gladly make an effort. Besides, I am glad to have anything to help pass the time. Harker is out, following up clues, and so are Lord Godalming and Quincy. Van Helsing sits in my study, poring over the record prepared by the Harkers. He seems to think that by accurate knowledge of all details he will light upon some clue. He does not wish to be disturbed in the work without cause. I would have taken him with me to see the patient, only I thought that after his last repulse he might not care to go again. There was also another reason. Renfield might not speak so freely before a third person as when he and I were alone. I found him sitting in the middle of the floor on his stool, a pose which is generally indicative of some mental energy on his part. When I came in, he said at once, as though the question had been waiting on his lips, "'What about souls?' It was evident, then, that my surmise had been correct. Unconscious cerebration was doing its work, even with the lunatic. I determined to have the matter out. "'What about them yourself?' I asked. He did not reply for a moment, but looked all around him, and up and down, as though he expected to find some inspiration for an answer. "'I don't want any souls,' he said in a feeble, apologetic way. The matter seemed preying on his mind, and so I determined to use it, to be cruel only to be kind. So I said, "'You like life, and you want life?' "'Oh, yes, but that is all right. You needn't worry about that. But,' I asked, "'how are we to get the life without getting the soul also?' This seemed to puzzle him, so I followed it up. A nice time you'll have some time when you're flying out there, with the souls of thousands of flies and spiders and birds and cats buzzing and twittering and moaning all around you. You've got their lives, you know, and you must put up with their souls. Something seemed to affect his imagination, for he put his fingers to his ears and shut his eyes, screwing them up tightly just as a small boy does when his face is being soaped. There was something pathetic in it that touched me. It also gave me a lesson, for it seemed that before me was a child, only a child, though the features were worn and the stubble on the jaws was white. It was evident that he was undergoing some process of mental disturbance, and knowing how his past moods had interpreted things seemingly foreign to himself, I thought I would enter into his mind as well as I could and go with him. The first step was to restore confidence— so I asked him, speaking pretty loud so that he would hear me through his closed ears, "'Would you like some sugar to get your flies around again?' He seemed to wake up all at once and shook his head. With a laugh he replied, "'Not much. Flies are poor things, after all.' After a pause he added, "'But I don't want their souls buzzing round me, all the same. "'Or spiders,' I went on. "'Blow spiders. What's the use of spiders? "'There isn't anything in them to eat or... He stopped suddenly, as though reminded of a forbidden topic. So, so, I thought to myself, this is the second time he has suddenly stopped at the word drink. What does it mean? Renfield seemed himself aware of having made a lapse, for he hurried on, as though to distract my attention from it. I don't take any stock at all in such matters. Rats and mice and such small deer, as Shakespeare has it. Chicken feed of the larder, they might be called. I'm past all that sort of nonsense. You might as well ask a man to eat molecules with a pair of chopsticks, as to try to interest me about the less carnivora, when I know of what is before me. I see, I said. You want big things that you can make your teeth meet in. How would you like to breakfast on an elephant? What ridiculous nonsense you are talking! He was getting too wide awake, so I thought I would press him hard. I wonder, I said reflectively, what an elephant's soul is like. The effect I desired was obtained, for he at once fell from his high horse and became a child again. "'I don't want an elephant's soul, or any soul at all,' he said. For a few moments he sat despondently. Suddenly he jumped to his feet, with his eyes blazing and all the signs of intense cerebral excitement. "'To hell with you and your souls!' he shouted. "'Why do you plague me about souls? Haven't I got enough to worry and pain to distract me already without thinking of souls?' He looked so hostile that I thought he was in for another homicidal fit, so I blew my whistle. The instant, however, that I did so, he became calm, 
and said apologetically, "'Forgive me, doctor, I forgot myself. "'You do not need any help. "'I am so worried in my mind that I am apt to be irritable. "'If you only knew the problem I have to face, "'and that I am working out, "'you would pity and tolerate and pardon me. "'Pray do not put me in a straight waistcoat. "'I want to think, and I cannot think freely "'when my body is confined. "'I am sure you will understand.' He had, evidently, self-control. So when the attendants came, I told them not to mind, and they withdrew. Renfield watched them go. When the door was closed, he said with considerable dignity and sweetness, "'Dr. Seward, you have been very considerate towards me. Believe me that I am very, very grateful to you.' I thought it well to leave him in this mood, and so I came away. There is certainly something to ponder over in this man's state. Several points seem to make what the American interviewer calls a story, if one could only get them in proper order. Here they are. Will not mention drinking. Fears the thought of being burdened with the soul of anything. Has no dread of wanting life in the future. Despises the meaner forms of life altogether, though he dreads being haunted by their souls. Logically, all these things point one way. He has assurance of some kind that he will acquire some higher life. He dreads the consequence, the burden of a soul. Then it is a human life he looks to. And the assurance? Merciful God, the Count has been to him, and there is some new scheme of terror afoot. Later, I went after my round to Van Helsing and told him of my suspicion. He grew very grave, and after thinking the matter over for a while, he asked me to take him to Renfield. I did so. As we came to the door, we heard the lunatic within singing gaily, as he used to do in the time which now seems so long ago. When we entered, we saw with amazement that he had spread out his sugar as of old. The flies, lethargic with the autumn, were beginning to buzz into the room. We tried to make him talk of the subject of our previous conversation but he would not attend. He went on with his singing, just as though we had not been present. He had got a scrap of paper and was folding it into a notebook. We had to come away as ignorant as we went in. His is a curious case indeed. We must watch him tonight. Letter Mitchell, Sons and Candy to Lord Godalming First October. My Lord, we are at all times only too happy to meet your wishes. We beg, with regard to the desire of your lordship, expressed by Mr. Harker on your behalf, to supply the following information concerning the sale and purchase of number 347 Piccadilly. The original vendors are the executors of the late Mr. Archibald Winter Suffield. The purchaser is a foreign nobleman, Count de Ville, who effected the purchase himself, paying the purchase money in notes over the counter, if your lordship will pardon us using so vulgar an expression. Beyond this we know nothing whatever of him. We are, my lord, your lordship's humble servants, Mitchell, Sons and Candy. Dr. Seward's Diary, 2nd October I placed a man in the corridor last night, and told him to make an accurate note of any sound he might hear from Renfield's room, and gave him instructions that if there should be anything strange, he was to call me. After dinner, when we had all gathered round the fire in the study, Mrs. Harker having gone to bed, we discussed the attempts and discoveries of the day. Harker was the only one who had any result, and we are in great hopes that his clue may be an important one. Before going to bed, I went round to the patient's room and looked in through the observation trap. He was sleeping soundly. His heart rose and fell with regular respiration. This morning the man on duty reported to me that a little after midnight he was restless and kept saying his prayers somewhat loudly. I asked him if that was all. He replied that it was all he heard. There was something about his manner so suspicious that I asked him point-blank if he had been asleep. He denied sleep, but admitted to having dozed for a while. It is too bad that men cannot be trusted unless they are watched. 
Today Harker is out following up his clue, and Art and Quincy are looking after horses. Godalming thinks that it would be well to have horses always in readiness, for when we get the information which we seek there will be no time to lose. We must sterilise all the imported earth between sunrise and sunset. We shall thus catch the Count at his weakest, and without a refuge to fly to. Van Helsing is off to the British Museum, looking up some authorities on ancient medicine. The old physicians took account of things which their followers do not accept, and the professor is searching for witch and demon cures which may be useful to us later. I sometimes think we must be all mad, and that we shall wake to sanity in straight waistcoats. Later. We have met again. We seem at last to be on the track, and our work of tomorrow may be the beginning of the end. I wonder if Renfield's quiet has anything to do with this. His moods have so followed the doings of the Count, that the coming destruction of the monster may be carried to him some subtle way. If we could only get some hint as to what passed in his mind, between the time of my argument with him today and his resumption of fly-catching, it might afford us a valuable clue. He is now seemingly quiet for a spell. Is he? That wild yell seemed to come from his room. The attendant came bursting into my room and told me that Renfield had somehow met with some accident. He had heard him yell, and when he went to him, found him lying on his face on the floor, all covered with blood. I must go at once. End of chapter 20「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith, Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com. Dracula by Bram Stoker, Chapter 21. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 3rd of October. Let me put down with exactness all that happened, as well as I can remember, since last I made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness I must proceed. When I came to Renfield's room I found him lying on the floor, on his left side, in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. There seemed none of the unity of purpose between the parts of the body which marks even lethargic sanity. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood originated. The attendant, who was kneeling beside the body, said to me as we turned him over, "'I think, sir, his back is broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralyzed.' How such a thing could have happened puzzled the attendant beyond measure. He seemed quite bewildered, and his brows were gathered in as he said, I can't understand the two things. He could mark his face like that by beating his own head on the floor. I saw a young woman do it once at the Eversfield Asylum before anyone could lay hands on her. And I suppose he might have broken his neck by falling out of bed if he got in an awkward kink. But for the life of me I can't imagine how the two things occurred. If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head. And if his face was like that before the fall out of bed, there would be marks on it. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing, and ask him to kindly come here at once. I want him without an instant's delay. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor, in his dressing gown and slippers, appeared. When he saw Renfield on the ground, he looked keenly at him a moment, then turned to me. I think he recognized my thought in my eyes, for he said very quietly, manifestly for the ears of the attendant, Ah, a sad accident. He will need very careful watching and much attention. I shall stay with you myself, but I shall first dress myself. If you will remain, I shall in a few minutes join you." The patient was now breathing stertorously, and it was easy to see that he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary celerity, bearing with him a surgical case. He had evidently been thinking and had his mind made up, for almost before he looked at the patient he whispered to me, "'Send the attendant away. We must be alone with him when he becomes conscious after the operation. I said, I think that will do now, Simmons. We have done all that we can at present. You had better go your round, and Dr. Van Helsing will operate. 
Let me know instantly if there be anything unusual anywhere. The man withdrew, and we went into a strict examination of the patient. The wounds of the face were superficial. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull extending right up through the motor area. The professor thought a moment and said, We must reduce the pressure and get back to normal conditions as far as can be. The rapidity of the suffusion shows the terrible nature of his injury. The whole motor area seems affected. The suffusion of the brain will increase quickly, so he must threaten at once, or it may be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping at the door. I went over and opened it, and found in the corridor without Arthur and Quincy in pajamas and slippers. The former spoke. I heard your man call up Dr. Van Helsing and tell him of an accident. So I woke Quincy, or rather called for him, as he was not asleep. Things are moving too quickly and too strangely for sound sleep for any of us these times. I've been thinking that tomorrow night we'll not see things as they have been. We'll have to look back and forward a little more than we have done. May we come in? I nodded, and held the door open till they had entered, then I closed it again. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient, and noted the horrible pool on the floor, he said softly, My God, what has happened to him? Poor, poor devil. I told him briefly, and added that we expected he would recover consciousness after the operation, for a short time at all events. He went at once and sat down on the edge of the bed, with Godalming beside him. We all watched in patience. "'We shall wait,' said Van Helsing, "'just long enough to fix the best spot for treffening, "'so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot, "'for it is evident that the hemorrhage is increasing.' "'The minutes during which we waited passed with fearful slowness. "'I had a horrible sinking in my heart, "'and from Van Helsing's face I gathered that he felt some fear or apprehension "'as to what was to come. "'I dreaded the words Renfield might speak. "'I was positively afraid to think.' but the conviction of what was coming was on me, as I have read of men who have heard the death watch. The poor man's breathing came in uncertain gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, but then would follow a prolonged stertorous breath, and he would relapse into a more fixed insensibility. Inured as I was to sick beds and death, the suspense grew and grew upon me. I could almost hear the beating of my own heart, and the blood surging through my temples sounded like blows from a hammer. Silence finally became agonizing. I looked at my companions, one after another, and saw from their flushed faces and damp brows that they were enduring equal torture. There was a nervous suspense over us all, as though overhead some dread bell would peal out powerfully when we should least expect it. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed on mine. His face was sternly set as he spoke. "'That is no time to lose. "'His words may be worth many lives. "'I have been thinking so as I stood here. "'It may be there is a soul at stake. "'We shall operate just above the ear.' "'Without another word he made the operation. "'For a few moments the breathing continued to be stertorous. "'Then there came a breath so prolonged "'that it seemed as though it would tear open his chest. "'Suddenly his eyes opened and became fixed "'in a wild, helpless stare. "'This was continued for a few moments.' Then it was softened into a glad surprise, and from his lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively, and as he did so, said, "'I'll be quiet, doctor. Tell them to take off the straight waistcoat. I have had a terrible dream, and it has left me so weak that I cannot move. What's wrong with my face? It feels all swollen, and it smarts dreadfully.' He tried to turn his head, but even with the effort his eyes seemed to grow glassy again, so I gently put it back. Then Van Helsing said, in a quiet, grave voice, "'Tell us your dream, Mr. Renfield.' As he heard the voice, his face brightened through its mutilation, and he said, "'That is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is of you to be here. Give me some water. My lips are dry, and I shall try to tell you. I dreamed—' He stopped and seemed fainting. I called quietly to Quincy. "'The brandy! It is in my study. Quick!' He flew and returned with a glass, the decanter of brandy, and a carafe of water. We moistened the parched lips, and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor injured brain had been working in the interval, for when he was quite conscious, he looked at me piercingly with an agonized confusion which I shall never forget, and said, I must not deceive myself. It was no dream, but all a grim reality. Then his eyes roved around the room. As they caught sight of the two figures sitting patiently on the edge of the bed, he went on, 
If I were not sure already, I would know from them. For an instant his eyes closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntarily, as though he were bringing all his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said hurriedly, and with more energy than he had yet displayed, Quick, doctor, quick! I am dying! I feel that I have but a few minutes, and then I must go back to death, or, or worse. Wet my lips with brandy again. I have something that I must say before I die, or before my crushed brain dies anyhow. Thank you. It was that night after you left me, when I implored you to let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for I felt my tongue was tied. But I was as sane then, except in that way, as I am now. I was in an agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Th then there came a sudden peace to me. My brain seemed to become cool again, and I realized where I was. I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As he spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked, but his hand came out and met mine and gripped it hard. He did not, however, betray himself. He nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Renfield proceeded. He came up to the window in the mist, as I had seen him often before, but he was solid then, not a ghost, and his eyes were fierce like a man's when angry. He was laughing with his red mouth. The sharp white teeth glinted in the moonlight when he turned to look back over the belt of trees to where the dogs were barking. I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to, just as he had wanted all along. Then he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? By making them happen, just as he used to send in the flies when the sun was shining great big fat ones with steel and sapphire on their wings, and big moths in the night with skull and crossbones on their backs. Van Helsing nodded to him, and he whispered to me unconsciously, The Acherantia Atropos of the Sphinges, what you call the death's head moth. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, Rats, 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 hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one a life and dogs to eat them, and cats too, all lives, all red blood, with years of life in it, and not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, for I wanted to see what he could do. Then the dogs howled, away beyond the dark trees, in his house. He beckoned me to the window. I got up and looked out, and he raised his hands, and seemed to call out without using any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming on like the shape of a flame of fire. And then he moved the mist to the right, and left, and I could see that there were thousands of rats, with their eyes blazing red, like his, only smaller. He held up his hand, and they all stopped, and I thought he seemed to be saying, All these lies will I give you, I am many more and greater, through countless ages, if you will fall down and worship me. And then a red cloud, like the color of blood, seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash and saying to him, Come in, Lord and Master! The rats were all gone, but he slid into the room through the sash, though it was only open an inch wide, just as the moon herself has often come in through the tiniest crack and has stood before me in all her size and splendor. His voice was weaker, so I moistened his lips with the brandy again, and he continued, but it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in the interval, for his story was further advanced. I was about to call him back to the point, but Van Helsing whispered to me, "'Let him go on. Do not interrupt him.' He could not go back, and maybe he could not proceed at all if once he lost the thread of his thought. He proceeded. All day I waited to hear from him, but he did not send me anything, not even a blowfly, and when the moon got up I was pretty angry with him. When he did slide in through the window, though it was shut and did not even knock, I got mad with him. He sneered at me, and his white face looked out of the mist with his red eyes gleaming, and he went on as though he owned the whole place and I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he went by me. I couldn't hold him. I thought that somehow Mrs. Harker had come into the room. The two men sitting on the bed stood up and came over, standing behind him so that he could not see them, but where they could hear better. They were both silent, but the professor started and quivered. His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on without noticing. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like tea, after the teapot has been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word. He went on. I didn't know that she was here till she spoke, and she didn't look the same. I don't care for the pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and hers all seemed to have run out. 
I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered, as I did, but we remained otherwise still. So when he came tonight I was ready for him. I saw the mist stealing in, and I grabbed it tight. I had heard that madmen have unnatural strength, and as I knew I was a madman, at times anyhow, I resolved to use my power. Ay, and he felt it too, for he had to come out of the mist to struggle with me. I held tight, and I thought I was going to win, for I didn't mean him to take any more of her life till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. "'We know the worst now,' he said. "'He is here, and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Let us be armed, the same as we were the other night, but lose no time. There is not an instant to spare.' There was no need to put our fear, nay our conviction, into words. We shared them in common. We all hurried and took from our rooms the same things that we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met in the corridor he pointed to them significantly as he said, They never leave me, and they shall not till this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friends. It is no common enemy that we deal with, alas, alas, that the Mina should suffer. He stopped, his voice was breaking, and I do not know if rage or terror predominated in my own heart. Outside the Harker's door we paused. Art and Quincy held back, and the latter said, "'Should we disturb her?' "'We must,' said Van Helsing grimly. "'If the door be locked, I shall break it in.' "'May it not frighten her terribly? It is unusual to break into a lady's room.' Van Helsing said solemnly, "'You are always right, but this is life and death.' All chambers are alike to the doctor, and even were they not, they are all as one to me to-night. Friend John, when I turn the handle, if the door does not open, do you put your shoulder down and shove, and you too, my friends. Now! He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash it burst open, and we almost fell headlong into the room. The professor did actually fall, and I saw across him as he gathered himself up from hands and knees. What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed, facing outwards, was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her stood a tall, thin man clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw we all recognized the Count in every way, even to the scar on his forehead. With his left hand he held both Mrs. Harker's hands, keeping them away with her arms at full tension. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare chest which was shown by his torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible resemblance to a child forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk to compel it to drink. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered at the edge, and the white sharp teeth behind the full lips of the blood-dripping mouth clamped together like those of a wild beast. With a wrench which threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height, he turned and sprang at us. But by this time the professor had gained his feet, and was holding toward him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count suddenly stopped, just as poor Lucy had done outside the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further back he cowered, as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed, as a great black cloud sailed across the sky and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapor. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, which with the recoil from its bursting open had swung back to its old position. Van Helsing, Art, and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath, and with it had given a scream so wild, so ear-piercing, so despairing, that it seems to me now that it will ring in my ears till my dying day. For a few seconds she lay in her helpless attitude in disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror. 
Then she put before her face her poor crushed hands, which bore on their whiteness the red mark of the Count's terrible grip, and from behind them came a low, desolate wail, which made the terrible scream seem only the quick expression of an endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the coverlet gently over her body, whilst Art, after looking at her face for an instant despairingly, ran out of the room. Van Helsing whispered to me, "'Jonathan is in a stupor such as we know the vampire can produce. We can do nothing with poor Madame Mina for a few moments till she recovers herself. I must wake him.' He dipped the end of a towel in cold water, and with it began to flick him on the face, his wife all the while holding her face between her hands and sobbing in a way that was heartbreaking to hear. I raised the blind and looked out of the window. There was much moonshine, and as I looked I could see Quincy Morris run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew-tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this. But at the instant I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness and turned to the bed. On his face, as there might well be, was a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, and then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once, and he started up. His wife was aroused by the quick movement, and turned to him with her arms stretched out as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them in again, and putting her elbows together, held her hands before her face, and shuddered till the bed beneath her shook. "'In God's name, what does this mean?' Harker cried out. "'Dr. Seward! Dr. Van Helsing! What is it? What has happened? What is wrong? Mina, dear, what is it? And what does that blood mean? My God, my God, has it come to this?' and raising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together. "'Good God, help us! Help her! Oh, help her!' With a quick movement he jumped from the bed, and began to pull on his clothes, all the man in him awake at the need for instant exertion. "'What has happened? Tell me all about it!' he cried without pausing. "'Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina, I know. Oh, do something to save her! It cannot have gone too far yet. Guard her while I look for him!' His wife, through her terror and horror and distress, saw some sure danger to him. Instantly forgetting her own grief, she seized hold of him and cried out, "'No, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me. I have suffered enough to-night, God knows, without the dread of his harming you. You must stay with me. Stay with these friends who will watch over you.' Her expression became frantic as she spoke. And he, yielding to her, she pulled him down, sitting on the bedside, and clung to him fiercely. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them both. The professor held up his golden crucifix, and said with wonderful calmness, "'Do not fear, my dear. We are here, and whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for to-night, and we must be calm and take counsel together.' She shuddered and was silent, holding down her head on her husband's breast. When she raised it, his white night-robe was stained with blood where her lips had touched, and where the thin open wound in the neck had sent forth drops. The instant she saw it, she drew back with a low wail and whispered amid choking sobs, "'Unclean! Unclean! I must touch him or kiss him no more! Oh, that it should be that it is I who am now his worst enemy, and whom he may have most cause to fear!' To this he spoke out resolutely, "'Nonsense, Mina! It is a shame to me to hear such a word. I would not hear it of you, and I shall not hear it from you. May God judge me by my deserts, and punish me with more bitter suffering than even this hour, if by any act or will of mine anything ever come between us. He put out his arms and folded her to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked at us over her bowed head, with eyes that blinked damply above his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set as steel. After a while her sobs became less frequent and more faint, and then he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness which I felt tried his nervous power to the utmost, "'And now, Dr. Seward, tell me all about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all that has been.' I told him exactly what had happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness, but his nostrils twitched and his eyes blazed as I told how the ruthless hands of the Count had held his wife in that terrible and horrid position with her mouth to the open wound in his breast. It interested me, even at that moment, to see that whilst the face of white set passion worked convulsively over the bowed head, the hands tenderly and lovingly stroked the ruffled hair. Just as I had finished, Quincy and Godalming knocked at the door. They entered in obedience to our summons. Van Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understood him to mean, if we were to take advantage of their coming, to divert, if possible, the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each other and from themselves. So, on nodding acquiescence to him, 
he asked them what they had seen or done, to which Lord Godalming answered, I could not see him anywhere in the passage or in any of our rooms. I looked in the study, but, though he had been there, he had gone. He had, however, he stopped suddenly, looking at the poor drooping figure on the bed. Van Helsing said gravely, Go on, friend Arthur. We want here no more concealments. Our hope now is in knowing all. Tell freely. So Art went on. He had been there, and though it could only have been for a few seconds, he had made rare hay of the place. All the manuscript had been burned, and the blue flames were flickering among the white ashes. The cylinders of your phonograph, too, were thrown on the fire, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. Thank God there is another copy in the safe. His face lit for a moment, but fell again as he went on. I ran downstairs, then, but could see no sign of him. I looked into Renfield's room, but there was no trace there except— Again he paused. "'Go on,' said Harker hoarsely. So he bowed his head, and moistening his lips with his tongue, added, "'Except that the poor fellow is dead.' Mrs. Harker raised her head. Looking from one to the other of us, she said solemnly, "'God's will be done.' I could not but feel that Art was keeping back something. But as I took it that it was with a purpose, I said nothing. Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, "'And you, friend Quincy, have you any to tell?' A little, he answered. It may be much eventually, but at present I can't say. I thought it well to know if possible where the Count would go when he left the house. I did not see him, but I saw a bat rise from Renfield's window and flap westward. I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfax, but he evidently sought some other lair. He will not be back tonight, for the sky is reddening in the east and the dawn is close. We must work tomorrow, said the latter words through his shut teeth. For a space of perhaps a couple of minutes there was silence, and I could fancy that I could hear the sound of our hearts beating. Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, "'And now, Madame Mina, poor dear, dead Madame Mina, tell us exactly what happened. God knows that I do not want that you be pained, but it is need that we know all. For now more than ever has all work to be done quick and sharp and in deadly earnest. The day is close to us that must end all, if it may be so, and now is the chance that we may live and learn. The poor dear lady shivered, and I could see the tension of her nerves as she clasped her husband closer to her and bent her head lower and lower still on his breast. Then she raised her head proudly, and held out one hand to Van Helsing, who took it in his, and after stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked in that of her husband, who held his other arm thrown round her protectingly. After a pause in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she began. I took the sleeping draught which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time it did not act. I seemed to become more wakeful, and myriads of horrible fancies began to crowd in upon my mind, all of them connected with death, and vampires, with blood and pain and trouble. Her husband involuntarily groaned, and as she turned to him and said lovingly, "'Do not fret, dear. You must be brave and strong, and help me through this horrible task. If you only knew what an effort it is to me to tell of this fearful thing at all, you would understand how much I need your help. Well, I saw I must try to help the medicine to do its work with my will, if it was to do me any good, so I resolutely set myself to sleep. Sure enough, sleep must soon have come to me, for I remember no more. Jonathan coming in had not waked me, for he lay by my side when next I remember. There was in the room the same thin white mist that I had before noticed. But I forget now if you know of this. You will find it in my diary, which I shall show you later. I felt the same vague terror which had come to me before, and the same sense of some presence. I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly that it seemed as if it was he who had taken the sleeping draught, and not I. I tried, but I could not wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then, indeed, my heart sank within me beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, or rather as if the midst had turned into his figure, for it had entirely disappeared, stood a tall thin man all in black. I knew him at once from the description of the others, the waxen face, the high aquiline nose, on which the light fell in a thin white line, the parted red lips, with the sharp white teeth showing between, and the red eyes that I had seemed to see in the sunset on the windows of St. Mary's Church at Whitby. I knew, too, the red scar on his forehead where Jonathan had struck him. For an instant my heart stood still, and I would have screamed out, only that I was paralyzed. In the pause he spoke in a sort of keen-cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. 
Silence! If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eyes. I was appalled, and was too bewildered to do or say anything. With a mocking smile, he placed one hand upon my shoulder, and, holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so, First, a little refreshment to reward my exertions. You may as well be quiet. It is not the first time or the second that your veins have appeased my thirst. I was bewildered, and strangely enough I did not want to hinder him. I suppose it is a part of the horrible curse that such is when his touch is on his victim. And, oh, my God, my God, pity me! He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hand harder and looked at him pityingly, as if he were the injured one, and went on. I felt my strength fading away, and I was in a half-swoon. How long this horrible thing lasted I know not, but it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away, and I saw it drip with a fresh blood. The remembrance seemed for a while to overpower her, and she drooped and would have sunk down but for her husband's sustaining arm. With a great effort she recovered herself and went on. Then he spoke to me mockingly, "'And so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my design. You know now, and they know in part already, and will know in full before long what it is to cross my path. They should have kept their energies for use closer to home, whilst they played wits against me, against me who commanded nations, and intrigued for them, and fought for them. Hundreds of years before they were born I was countermining them.' And you, their best beloved one, are now to me, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, kin of my kin, my bountiful winepress for a while, and shall be later on my companion and my helper. You shall be avenged in turn, for not one of them but shall minister to your needs. But as yet you are to be punished for what you have done. You have aided in thwarting me. Now you shall come to my call. When my brain says, Come to you, you shall cross land or sea to do my bidding, and to that end this— with that he pulled open his shirt, and with his long sharp nails opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt out, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound, so that I must either suffocate or swallow some to the— Oh, my God! My God! What have I done? What have I done to deserve such a fate, I who have tried to walk in meekness and righteousness all my days? God pity me! Look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril! and in mercy pity those to whom she is dear. Then she began to rub her lips, as though to cleanse them from pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken, and everything became more and more clear. Harker was still and quiet, but over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a gray look, which deepened and deepened in the morning light, till when the first red streak of the coming dawn shot up, the flesh stood darkly out against the whitening hair. We have arranged that one of us is to stay within call of the unhappy pair till we can meet together and arrange about taking action. Of this I am sure. The sun rises today on no more miserable house in all the great round of its daily course. End of chapter 21 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Kitu Malwani Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 22 Jonathan Harker's Journal October 3rd As I must do something or go mad, I write this diary. It is now six o'clock, and we are to meet in the study in half an hour and take something to eat. For Dr. Val Helsing and Dr. Seward are agreed that if we do not eat, we cannot work our best. Our best will be, God knows, required today. I must keep writing at every chance, for I dare not stop to think. All, big and little, must go down. Perhaps at the end the little things may teach us most. The teaching, big or little, could not have landed Mina or me anywhere worse than we are today. However, we must trust and hope. Poor Mina told me just now, with tears running down her dear cheeks, that it is in trouble and trial that our faith is tested that we must keep on trusting, and that God will aid us up to the end. The end! Oh, my God, what end! To work, to work! When Dr. Val Helmsing and Dr. Seward had come back from seeing poor Renfield, we went gravely into what was to be done. First, Dr. Seward told us that when he and Dr. Van Helmsing had gone down to the room below, 
they had found Renfield lying on the floor, all in a heap. His face was all bruised and crushed in, and the bones of the neck were broken. Dr. Seward asked the attendant who was on duty in the passage if he had heard anything. He said that he had been sitting down, he confessed to half dozing, when he heard loud voices in the room, and that Renfield had called out loudly several times, God, God, God! After that, there was the sound of falling. When he entered the room, he found him lying on the floor, face down, just as the doctors had seen him. Van Helsing asked if he had heard voices or a voice, and he said he could not say, that at first it had seemed to him as if there were two, but as there was no one in the room, it could have been only one. He could swear to it, if required, that the word God was spoken by the patient. Dr. Sievert said to us, when we were alone, that he did not wish to go into the matter. The question of an inquest had to be considered, and it would never do to put forward the truth, as no one would believe it. As it was, he thought that on the attendant's evidence, he could give a certificate of death by misadventure in falling from bed. In case the coroner should demand it, there would be a formal inquest, necessarily to the same result. When the question began to be discussed as to what should be our next step, the very first thing we decided was that Mina should be in full confidence, that nothing of any sort, no matter how painful, should be kept from her. She herself agreed to its wisdom, and it was pitiful to see her so brave and yet so sorrowful and in such depths of despair. There must be no concealment, she said. Alas, we have had too much already, and besides, there is nothing in all the world that can give me more pain than I have already endured, than I suffer now. Whatever may happen, it must be of new hope or of new courage to me. Van Helsing was looking at her fixedly as she spoke and said, suddenly but quietly, But dear Madam Mina, are you not afraid? Not for yourself, but for others from yourself, after what has happened? Her face grew set in its lines but her eyes shone with the devotion of a martyr as she answered, Ah, no, for my mind is made up. To what? he asked gently, whilst we were all very still, for each in our own way we had a sort of vague idea of what she meant. Her answer came with direct simplicity, as though she was simply stating a fact. Because if I find it in myself, and I shall certainly watch keenly for it, a sign of harm to any that I love, I shall die. You would kill yourself? he asked hoarsely. I would, if there were no friend who loved me, who would save me from such a pain and so desperate an effort. She looked at him meaningly as she spoke. He was sitting down, but now he rose and came close to her and put his hand on her head as he said solemnly, My child, there is such a one, if it were for your good, for myself, I could hold it in my account with God to find such a euthanasia for you, even at this moment, if it were best, nay, if it were safe. But my child! For a moment he seemed choked, and a great sob rose in his throat. He gulped it down and went on. There are here some who would stand between you and death. You must not die. You must not die by any hand, but least of all your own, until the other who has fouled your sweet life, is true dead, you must not die, for if he is still with the quick undead, your death would make you even as he is. No, you must live, you must struggle and strive to live, though death would seem a boon unspeakable. You must fight death himself, though he come to you in pain or in joy, by the day or the night, in safety or in peril, on your living soul I charge you that you do not die, nay, nor think of death, till this great evil be past. The poor dear grew white as death, and shook and shivered as I have seen a quicksand shiver and shake at the incoming of a tide. We were all silent. We could do nothing. At length she grew more calm, and turning to him said sweetly, but oh so sorrowfully, as she held out her hand, I promise you, my dear friend, that if God will let me live, I shall strive to do so, till, if it may be in his good time, this horror may have passed from me. 
She was so good and brave that we all felt that our hearts were strengthened to work and endure for her, and we began to discuss what we were to do. I told her that she was to have all the papers in the safe, and all the papers or diaries and phonographs that we might hereafter use, and was to keep the record as she, as she had done before. She was pleased with the prospect of anything to do, if pleased could be used in connection with so grim an interest. As usual, Van Helsing had thought ahead of everyone else, and was prepared with an exact ordering of our work. It is perhaps well, he said, that at our meeting after our visit to Carfax, we decided not to do anything with the earth boxes that lay there. Had we done so, the Count must have guessed our purpose and would doubtless have taken measures in advance to frustrate such effort as regard to the others. But now he does not know our intentions. Nay, more in all probability, he does not know that such a power exists to us as can sterilize his lairs, so that he cannot use them as of old. We are now so much further advanced in our knowledge as to their disposition, that when we have examined the house in Piccadilly, we may track the very last of them. Today, then, is ours, and in it rests our hope. The sun that rose on our sorrow this morning guards us in its course. Until it sets tonight, that monster must retain whatever form he now has. He is confined within the limitations of his earthly envelope. He cannot melt into thin air, nor disappear through cracks or chinks or crannies. If he goes through a doorway, he must open the door like a mortal. And so we have this day to hunt down all his lairs and sterilize them. So we shall, if we have not yet catch him and destroy him, drive him to bay in some place where the catching and the destroying shall be in time, sure. Here I started up, for I could not contain myself at the thought that the minutes and seconds so preciously laden with Nina's life and happiness were flying from us, since whilst we talked, action was impossible. But Van Helsing held up his hand warningly. Nay, friend Jonathan, he said, in this the quickest way home is the longest way, so your proverbs say. We shall all act, and act with desperate quick, when the time has come. But think, in all probable, the key of the situation is in that house in Piccadilly. The Count may have many houses which he has bought. Of them he will have deeds of purchase, keys, and other things. He will have paper that he write on. He will have his books of checks. There are so many belongings that he must have somewhere. Why not in this place so central, so quiet, where he come and go by the front or the back at all hours, when, in the very vast of the traffic, there is none to notice? We shall go there and search that house, and when we learn what it holds, then we do what our friend Arthur calls, in his phrases of hunt, Stop the earth, and so we run down our old fox. So, is it no? Then let us come at once, I cried. We are wasting the precious, precious time. The professor did not move, but simply said, And how are we to get into that house in Piccadilly? Anyway, I cried, we shall break in if need be. And your police? Where will they be, and what will they say? I was staggered. But I knew that if he wished to delay, he had a good reason for it. So I said as quietly as I could, Don't wait more than need be. You know I am sure what torture I am in. Ah, my child, that I do. And indeed there is no wish of me to add to your anguish. But just think what can we do until all the world be at movement. Then will come our time. I have thought and thought and it seems to me that the simplest way is the best of all. Now, we wish to get into the house, but we have no key. Is it not so? I nodded. Now, suppose that you were, in truth, the owner of the house, and could not still get in, and think there was to you no conscience of the housebreaker, what would you do? I should get me a respectable locksmith and set him to work to pick the lock for me. And your police, they would interfere, would they not? Oh, no, not if they knew the man was properly employed. Then, he looked at me as keenly as he spoke, all that is in doubt is the conscience of the employer and the belief of your policeman as to whether or not that employer has a good conscience 
or a bad one. Your police must indeed be zealous men and clever, oh, so clever in reading the heart that they trouble themselves in such matter. No, no, my friend Jonathan, you go take the lock off a hundred empty houses in this your London or of any city in the world, and if you do it as such things are rightly done, and at the time such things are rightly done, no one will interfere. I have read of a gentleman who owned a so fine house in London, and when he went for months of summer to Switzerland and lock up his house, some burglar come and broke window at back and got in. Then he went and made open the shutters in front and walk out and in through the door before the very eyes of the police. Then he have an auction in that house and advertise it and put up big notice. And when the day come, he sell off by a great auctioneer all the goods of that other man who owned them. Then he go to a builder and he sell in that house, making an agreement that he pull it down and take all away within a certain time. And your police and other authorities help him all they can. And when that owner come back from his holiday in Switzerland, he find only an empty hole where his house had been. This was all done in wrongly, and in our work we shall be on wrongly too. We shall not go so early that policemen who have little to think of shall deem it strange. But we shall go after ten o'clock, when there are many about, and such things would be done, were we indeed owners of the house. I could not but see how right he was, and the terrible despair of Mina's face became relaxed in thought. There was hope in such good counsel. Van Helsing went on. When once within the house, we may find more clues. At any rate, some of us can remain there, whilst the rest find the other places where there be more earth boxes, at Bermondsey and Miles End. Lord Godlemring stood up. I can be of some use here, he said. I shall wire to my people to have horses and carriages where they will be most convenient. Look here, old fellow, said Morris. It is a capital idea to have all ready in case you want to go horsebacking, but don't you think that one of your snappy carriages with its heraldic adornments in a byway of Walsworth or Miles End would attract too much attention for our purpose? It seems to me we ought to take cabs when we go south or east, or even leave them somewhere near the neighbourhood where we are going to. Friend Quincy is right, said the professor. His head is what you call in plain with the horizon. It is a difficult thing that we go to do, and we do not want no peoples to watch us, if so it may. Mina took a growing interest in everything, and I was rejoiced to see that the exigencies of affairs was helping her to forget for a time the terrible experience of the night. She was very, very pale, almost ghastly, and so thin that her lips were drawn away, showing her teeth in somewhat of prominence. I did not mention this last, lest it should give her needless pain, but it made my blood run cold in my veins to think of what had occurred with poor Lucy when the Count had sucked her blood. As yet there was no sign of the teeth growing sharper, but the time was as yet short, and there was time for fear. When we came to the discussion of the sequence of our efforts and of the disposition of our forces, there were new sources of doubt. It was finally agreed that before starting for Piccadilly, we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand. In case he should find it out too soon, we would thus still be ahead of him in our work of destruction. And his presence in his purely material shape, and at his weakest, might give us some new clue. As to the disposition of forces, it was suggested by the professor that after our visit to Carfax, we should all enter the house in Piccadilly that the two doctors and I should remain there, whilst Lord Godamring and Quincy found the lairs at Walsworth and Miles End and destroyed them. It was possible, if not likely, the professor urged, that the Count may appear in Piccadilly during the day, and that, if so, we might be able to cope with him there and then. At any rate, we might be able to follow him in force. To this plan I strenuously objected, and so far as my going was concerned, for I said that I intended to stay and protect Mina. I thought that my mind was made up on the subject, but Mina would not listen to my objections. She said that that might be some law matter in which I could be useful. 
that amongst the Count's papers might be some clue which I could understand out of my experience in Transylvania, and that, as it was, all the strength we could muster was required to cope with the Count's extraordinary power. I had to give in, for Mina's resolution was fixed. She said that it was the last hope for her that we should all work together. As for me, she said, I have no fear. Things have been as bad as they can be, and whatever may happen must have in it some element of hope or comfort. Go, my husband. God can, if he wishes it, guard me as well alone as with any one present. So I started up, crying out, Then in God's name let us come at once, for we are losing time. The Count may come to Piccadilly earlier than we think. Not so, said Van Helsing, holding up his hand. But why? I asked. Do you forget, he said with actually a smile, that last night he banqueted heavily and will sleep late? Did I forget? Shall I ever, can I ever, can any of us ever forget that terrible scene? Mina struggled hard to keep her brave countenance, but the pain overmastered her and she put her hands before her face and shuddered whilst she moaned. Van Helsing had not intended to recall her frightful experience. He had simply lost sight of her and her part in the affair in his intellectual effort. When it struck him what he said, he was horrified at his thoughtlessness and tried to comfort her. Oh, Madam Mina, he said, dear, dear Madam Mina, alas, that I, of all who so reverence you, should have said anything so forgetful. These stupid old lips of mine and this stupid old head do not deserve so, but you will forget it, will you not? He bent low beside her as he spoke. She took his hand, and looking at him through her tears, said hoarsely, No, I shall not forget, for it is well that I remember, and with it I have so much in memory of you that is sweet that I take it all together. Now, you must all be going soon. Breakfast is ready, and we must all eat that we may be strong. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. We tried to be cheerful and encourage each other, and Mina was the brightest and most cheerful of us. When it was over, Van Helsing stood up and said, Now, my dear friends, we go forth to our terrible enterprise. Are we all armed, as we were on that night when first we visited our enemy's lair, armed against ghostly as well as carnal attacks? We all assured him. Then it is well. Now, Madam Mina, you are in any case quite safe here until the sunset. And before then we shall return, if... We shall return. But before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. I have myself, since you came down, prepared your chamber by the placing of things, of which we know, so that he may not enter. Now let me guard yourself. On your forehead, I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear... As he had placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared it, had burned into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. My poor darling's brain had told her the significance of the fact as quickly as her nerves received the pain of it, and the two so overwhelmed her that her overwrought nature had its voice in that dreadful scream. But the words to her thought came quickly. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring on the air when there came the reaction, and she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement. Pulling her beautiful hair over her face, as the leper of old his mantle, she wailed out, Unclean! Unclean! Even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh. I must bear this mark of shame on my forehead until judgment day. They all paused. I had thrown myself beside her in an agony of helpless grief and, putting my arms around her, held her tight. For a few moments, our sorrowful hearts beat together while the friends around us turned away their eyes that ran tears silently. Then, when Helsing turned and said gravely, so gravely that I could not help feeling that he was in some way inspired and was stating things outside himself, it may be that you shall have to bear that mark till God himself sees fit, 
as he most surely shall on that judgment day, to redress all wrongs of the earth and of his children that he has placed thereon. And, O oh, Madamina, my dear, my dear, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar, the sign of God's knowledge of what has been, shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the heart we know. For so surely as we live, that scar shall pass away when God sees right to lift the burden that is hard upon us. Till then we bear our cross, as his son did in, his, in obedience to his will. It may be that we are chosen instruments of his good pleasure, and that we ascend to his bidding as that other through stripes and shame, through fears and blood, through doubts and fear, and all that makes the difference between God and man. There was hope in his voice, and comfort, and the need for resignation. Mina and I both felt so, and simultaneously we each took one of the old man's hands, bent over it, and kissed it. Then, without a word, we all knelt down together, and all holding hands, swore to be true to each other. We men pledged ourselves to raise the veil of sorrow from the head of her whom, each in his own way, we loved and we prayed for help and guidance in the terrible task which lay before us. It was then time to start. So I said farewell to Mina, a parting which neither of us shall forget to our dying day, and we set out. To one thing I have made up my mind. If we find out that Mina must be a vampire in the end, then she shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I suppose it is thus that in old times one vampire meant many. Just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth, so the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for their ghastly ranks. We entered Carfax without trouble, and found all things the same as on that first occasion. It was hard to believe that amongst so prosaic surroundings of neglect and dust and decay, there was any ground for such fear as already we knew. Had not our minds been made up, and had there not been terrible memories to spur us on, we could hardly have proceeded with our tasks. We found no papers, or any sign of use in the house, and in the old chapel the great boxes looked just as we had seen them last. Dr. Van Helsing said to us solemnly as we stood before him, And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilize this earth so sacred of holy memories, that he has brought from a far distant land for such fell use. He has chosen this earth because it has been holy. Thus we defeat him with his own weapon, for we make it more holy still. It was sanctified to such use of man, now we sanctify it to God. As he spoke, he took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown open. The earth smelled musty and close, but we did not somehow seem to mind, for our attention was concentrated on the professor. Taking from his box a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it down reverently on the earth, and then shutting down the lid began to screw it home, we aiding him as he worked. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them to all appearances but in each was a portion of the host. When we closed the door behind us, the professor said solemnly, So much is already done. It may be that with all the others we can be so successful. Then the sunset of this evening may shine of Madame Mina's forehead all white as ivory and with no stain. As we passed across the lawn on our way to the station to catch our train, we could see the front of the asylum. I looked eagerly, and in the window of my own room saw Mina. I waved my hand to her, and nodded to tell that our work there was successfully accomplished. She nodded in reply to show that she understood. The last I saw her, she was waving her hand in farewell. It was with a heavy heart that we sought the station and just caught the train, which was steaming in as we reached the platform. I have written this in the train. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. Just before we reached Fenchurch Street, Lord Godamring said to me, 
Quincy and I will find a locksmith. You had better not come with us in case there should be any difficulty, for under the circumstances it wouldn't seem so bad for us to break into an empty house. But you are a solicitor, and the Incorporated Law Society might tell you that you should have known better. I demurred as to my not sharing any danger, even of odium, but he went on. Besides, it will attract less attention if there are not too many of us. My title will make it all right with the locksmith and with any police that might come along. You had better go with Jack and the professor and stay in Green Park, somewhere in sight of the house. And when you see the door opened and the smith has gone away, do you all come across? We shall be on the lookout for you and shall let you in. The advice is good, said Van Helsing, so we said no more. Codemling and Morris hurried off in a cab, we following in another. At the corner of Arlington Street, our contingent got out and strolled into the green park. My heart beat as I saw the house on which so much of our hope was centred, looming up grim and silent in its deserted condition amongst its more lively and spruced-up neighbours. We sat down on a bench within good view and began to smoke cigars so as to attract as little attention as possible. The minutes seemed to pass with leaden feet as we waited for the coming of the others. At length, we saw a four-wheeler drive up. Out of it, in leisurely fashion, got Lord Godamring and Morris, and down from the box descended a thick-set working man with his rush-woven basket of tools. Morris paid the cabman, who touched his hat, and drove away. Together, the two ascended the steps, and Lord Godamring pointed out what he wanted done. The workman took off his coat leisurely and hung it on one of the spikes of the rail, saying something to the policeman who just then sauntered by. The policeman nodded acquiescence, and the man kneeling down placed his bag beside him. After searching through it, he took out a selection of tools, which he proceeded to lay beside him in orderly fashion. Then he stood up, looked in the keyhole, blew into it, and turning to his employers, made some remark. Lord Godamring smiled, and the man lifted a good-sized bunch of keys. Selecting one of them, he began to probe the lock, as if feeling his way with it. After fumbling about for a bit, he tried a second and then a third. All at once, the door opened under a slight push from him, and he and the two others entered the hall. We sat still. My own cigar burned furiously, but Van Helsing's went cold altogether. We waited patiently, as we saw the workman come out and bring his bag. Then he held the door partly open, steadying it with his knees, whilst he fitted a key to the lock. This he finally handed to Lord Godamring, who took out his purse and gave him something. The man touched his hat, took his bag, put on his coat and departed. Not a soul took the slightest notice of the whole transaction. When the man had fairly gone, we three crossed the street and knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by Quincy Morris, besides whom stood Lord Godlemring lighting a cigar. The place smells so vilely, said the latter as we walked in. It did indeed smell vilely, like the old chapel at Carfax. And with our previous experience, it was plain to us that the Count had been using the place pretty freely. We moved to explore the house, all keeping together in case of attack, for we knew we had a strong and wily enemy to deal with, and as yet we did not know whether the Count might not be in the house. In the dining room, which lay at the back of the hall, we found eight boxes of earth. Eight boxes only out of the nine which we sought. Our work was not over, and would never be until we had found the missing box. First we opened the shutters of a window, which looked out across a narrow stone flagged yard, at the blank face of a stable, pointed to look like the front of a miniature house. There were no windows in it, so we were not afraid of being overlooked. We did not lose any time in examining the chests. With the tools which we had brought with us, we opened them one by one and treated them as we had treated those others in the old chapel. It was evident to us that the Count was not at present in the house, and we proceeded to search for any of his effects. After a cursory glance at the rest of the rooms, from basement to attic, we came to the conclusion that the dining room contained any effects which might belong to the Count. 
and so we proceeded to minutely examine them. They lay in a sort of orderly disorder on the great dining room table. There were title deeds of the Piccadilly house in a great bundle, deeds of the purchase of the houses at Miles End and Bermondsey, note paper envelopes and pens and ink, all were covered up in a thin wrapping paper to keep them from the dust. There was also a clothes brush, a brush and comb, and a jug and basin, the latter containing dirty water which was redden as if with blood. Last of all was a little heap of keys of all sorts and sizes, probably those belonging to the other houses. When we had examined this last find, Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris, taking accurate notes of the various addresses of the houses in the east and south, took with them the keys in a great bunch, and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. The rest of us are, with what patience we can, waiting their return, or the coming of the Count. End of chapter 22 of Dracula